Robert Godlinton by H. W. Bidwell. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Robert Godlinton, born in London, September 1794, died at Grahamstown, 30th of May, 1884. Mourn, Africa, your oldest, noblest sage sleeps the long sleep. Your noblest, I, for he whose name the role of true nobility next heads may well be proud how bright a page his history fills the franklin of our age who wrought for truth for liberty and light the aim of all his fourscore years and ten was peace on earth and good will towards man right for the wronged weak for wronging right confusion how he strove with sword tongue pen as soldier statesman writer giving all the glorious dower of his heart and brain to us and god until he took again the life which could we we would fain recall the measure of his influence who can tell we know not whether from that distant home to which the all-wise has taken him he may come in spirit to the land he served so well but this we know the good that he has wrought the examples set the lessons he has taught as scattered seed on time's ever rolling flood immortal are and can but work us good h w bidwell end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Diamond Digger by H. W. Bidwell. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. On Finding His First Large Diamond. From the Drama IDB. What change of luck, O oh fortune! They have well compared thee to a woman ever flying, but luring on when hope led we pursue, and when we scorn thee coming back all smiles o'erwhelming us with the richest choicest favors looks at the diamond can it be real can i believe my eyes a gem like thee would grace a monarch's crown ay and would buy his empire from him too for smaller and less precious gems than thee have monarchs been betrayed and empires sold for less than thee beauties whose hearts of steel not all the worship of true love could move have given their charms to arms they else had loath but o oh, thou glittering bauble canst thou buy one sigh of pure affection one small grain of truth call back the loved ones gone give respite to the wretch condemned to die or win redemption for a soul that's lost ah no truth is the bright pure gem compared with her thou art very dross indeed yet thou art mine 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 my own mine only and as yet no other eyes but mine have gazed upon thy dazzling splendor how strange it seems that thou who hast lain hid down in the very heart of earth and in the very womb as twere of hoary time cycles long long ere history was born now comest forth like some new chosen sultana from the zenana's gloom where all her light her glory and her beauty blazed in vain the fabled sleeping beauty sure thou wert i the proud prince whose vivifying touch called thee to light and gave thy splendor life the thought is overpowering and the feeling with which I call thee mine is not all joy. I've heard how gems like thee, which it has cost the owners years of patient toil to win, have caused their death when won, that woe, not bliss, have followed their possession, and a thrill while now I clutch thee seemeth to forebode some coming evil. Were it known I go about, with a king's ransom in my pocket my life would not be safe no i must hide thee 
as a thief would hide his stolen prize. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Last of the Bokers by H. W. Bidwell. Etenhaga, May 21st. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. A Dirge. Alas, is it true that the great R. M. Boker no longer in Parliament covets a place, but follows his brethren, this gigantic joker, the greatest, the last of a very slow race? First Thomas the Tartar, then William the Whaler, knocked under, they couldn't keep pace with the age. Now the last of the trio, great Robert the Railer, has made his bow curtly and gone from the stage. But, oh, in the Senate the gap will be shocking. Long, long will be missed that cantankerous face. He stood six foot three in his feldchon and stocking. T'will take a broad chill mon to fill up his place. Though his broadcloth was broadest, his humor was broader. Though his legs were the longest, the length of his jaw outdid them. Yet he was ne'er once called to order by the fierce little knight whose mere wigs nod was law. There may in the future be low jokes and high jokes, and good jokes and jokes good for nothing at all. But no more his sly jokes, his wry jokes and dry jokes, for this flower of all jokers is gone to the wall. But oh, on the road as life's journey we drag on, whether main road or branch, grief will turn on her mane, to think how that highly distinguished buck wagon will ne'er take that buck of a wagon again. Yet, a paradox, trucking along on the mail road, he was, as I'll prove, though twill nothing avail. Though he growled at the railroad and kept the old frail road, the whole of his journey he kept on the rail. But what of the house, without one boker in it, like a wagon deprived of its brake, down twill go, and the whole span of Parliament into infinite disorder will rush with their octor as flow. Well, peace to the manes of these shaggy old lions. May the song of the steam engine lull them to rest. May they, free from obstruction, protest, and defiance, but not in a buck wagon, go to the blest. Be this their escutcheon, a steam engine rampant, a patriot floored, on the floor of the house, a skinned nigger salient, sixteen oxen couchant, a wagon smashed up, and a broken down smouse. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Drunkard's Child by H. W. Bidwell. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Founded on one of J. B. Goff's thrilling anecdotes. I cannot spare that book, Papa. Take all I have beside. But that my poor, my dear Mama, gave me the day she died, and bade me keep it for her sake. If all your money's spent, sell all my toys, but do not take my little testament. She told me that I there might read the way to heaven above. I cannot part with it, indeed, her last dear gift of love. There stood beside that couch of straw, all haggard, wretched, wild, the drunkard father staggering o'er his sweet but dying child. And as she spoke, a father's tear stole down his bloated cheek, and thus he cried, Hush, Fanny dear, tis not your book I seek. But, oh, this cursed, burning thirst has made me mad, I think. I take your book. I'd perish first, and yet I must have drink. Come, child, no more that sad, pale look. There, dry your weeping eye. I would not steal your little book. For all the world, not I. Her sighs and sobs are now at rest. For see, the maiden sleeps. But closely to her little book, the testament she keeps. There bathed in beauteous tears she lay, like some half-drooping flower. 
cropped ere the sun has kissed away the grief of evening's hour there stood the man his burning tongue half cursing his intent as stealthily from fanny's breast he took the testament not all a father's love could break the dread the cursed spell that binds the drunkard to his glass and drags his soul to hell but deaf to sweet affection's voice dread to the fear of sin away he bore the cherished pledge and bartered it for gin now once again he dares beside that wretched couch to stand and gazes on his dying child the bottle in his hand how shall he meet her dying face he dare not cannot think but all reflection all disgrace drowns in absorbing drink but see his little daughter wakes and seeks her book in vain yet murmurs not how calm she takes the sickness and the pain but though the ghastly hues of death o'er her wan features roll a beam of immortality is borrowed from the soul that lightens up her waning eye with an unearthly light that tells the spirit plumes its wings for an eternal flight father she cried i'm dying now nay father do not weep i know you took my testament when i was fast asleep but i forgive you father dear come sit down by my side say do you think i'll get to heaven you know how hard i've tried i think i shall i know i shall for in my book i read let little children come to me that's what the saviour said but father when i get to heaven and my poor dear mamma and all those angels pure and bright shall speak of you papa and ask me what you did with it my mother's darling book what shall your fanny say to them father how ill you look oh mercy child the father cries what hope is there for me oh i have broken all the ties of loved humanity see here and with a dreadful oath the bottle down he cast thus do i break the drunkard's chains i freed myself at last nay curse not father dear but pray how can i pray he cried i'll teach you father come this way there kneel down by my side he knelt and in response to her repeated word for word to me a sinner deep and black be merciful o lord she died and as the angels bore her little spirit home they sang in joy o'er the drunkard's soul thus rescued from its doom and a poem this recording is in the public domain the angel's message by h w bidwell read for librivox.org by sandra schmidt the angel's message twas a beautiful evening towards the calm west the god of the summer triumphantly rolled as the glory gates opened to receive their bright guest they let out a torrent of heaven's own gold it mellowed the lawn where the poplar's tall spire threw a shade which dissolved as it longer became it lit up the hall like a temple of fire as its old norman windows reflected the flame all was silent for philomel yet did not raise his song which both sadness and rapture inspire the thrush and finch ceased their vesper of praise to gaze on the glory and mutely admire the newly-born zephyr so gentle and mild strayed over the lawn to a chamber above where her sad mother sighed over her withering child the frail blossom born of unsanctified love oh the sigh from an innocent heart like the breeze which distills from the flowers those essences rare too subtle for even the inquisitive bees is laden with sweetness 
that medicines care but not so the breathings exhaled from the breast where guilt makes a sepulchre shame finds a home and the hope that with virtue alone deigns to rest with its heavenly solace may never more come yet the scene was so tranquil the grandeur so calm that its influence even to that sad heart would steal like an angel of charity pouring its balm to soothe the deep wound that it never might heal and the mother sat watching that dear life whose ebb was so stealthy that even love's fears were beguiled till the spider face sleep spun its magical web twixt the frail one's fond eyes and her innocent child and the soft sapphires played on each delicate brow like tender caresses of angels unseen now lifting a curl from a forehead of snow now kissing a cheek where a tear pearl had been they are dreaming hark whence that mysterious sound like the wild harp of aeolus disturbed by the wings of some spirit that playfully hovers around and fan into song the invisible strings or the hymn which the spirit of god's universe sings unto the planets and suns as they roll or the chorus celestial beings rehearse when they welcome to heaven an innocent soul lo a ladder of sunbeams shoots down from the skies to the child and the host of bright beings appear and as they descend their sweet voices arise more loud and distinct on the mother's rapt ear oh never has the tongue of a mortal expressed the accents that fall on the ears of the soul the thoughts to an atom of spirit addressed by its infinite mighty mysterious whole the silver-winged choristers press round the pair the chorus is ceased but the voice far more sweet in its unaided melody takes up the air which feebly the muse thus essays to repeat this is the dear sister our love longs to win soft bear her away to the home of the blest ere a pang of earth's sorrow or taint of its sin has stricken or sullied her innocent breast they raise her again in rich harmony blend the sweet voices a glance half of joy half of pain they beam on the mother then gracefully wend the ethereal pathway to heaven again the chorus expires their images shown in the dimness of distance like faint shadows seem till the gates now regained are wide open thrown and each form stands revealed in the outrushing gleam the child is upraised in a halo of light more radiant far than was ever seen on this earth it smiles an adieu then departs from the sight the gates close it enters its heavenly birth all was dark till a bright star appeared in the place shedding down like a beacon of hope its pure ray and the mother awaking rushed forth to embrace not her child but the husk which its soul cast away and oft when the earliest shadows of night veil the earth the bereaved one will gaze on that star there is joy in its glory and hope in its light for it seems like her child looking down from afar h w bidwell grahamston eighteen sixty two end of poem this recording is in the public domain the churl of the period and another by h w bidwell read for librivox dot org by sandra schmidt the churl of the period and another a legend of the past present and future the churl wild wild was the night on the wild wild karoo confoundedly wild near the kraal called baru although after kirkwood's advertisement reading you'd think baru kraal hottentot dutch for eden well the storm monarch reigned in this wild wilderness 
and the traveller who hailed from the port little bess reined his charger and then through the darkness did peer twigged some lights and concluded a liver was near for he longed that he shortly some shelter might find did this travel-worn reed shaken by the wild wind the lightning was blazing behind and before so he thundered away at the house of the boar in a crack and his crackers mine hair did appear and exclaimed in the name of the drommel we star said the stranger i'm shaking from toe-tip to crown these roads shake me up so i crave a shake down baru crawled some distance my steed is so weary he'd never crawl to carry me near to friend kiri i don't care a button how poor is your cheer but in mercy i pray you to put me somewhere mine hair gave a grunt and he slammed to the door and our friend was left out in the cold as before three months had passed by when quite early one day this intractable boor made tracks to the bay he was met by our friend who had now ceased to roam and kindly invited to go with him home so he went with our friend and entered his house and was thus introduced to his genial spouse i've brought home a queer kind of homo my dear let not homopathy curtail your cheer get best things in season in order to show hospitality's here as well's up by barrow the table soon groaned neath the daintiest store that ever yet tickled the taste of a boar mine hair guzzled coffee with hennessy's stick in and stowed away no end of broiled ham and chicken the crevices filling up well with poached eggs till tight as a drum he arose on his legs his host arose also and cried you old beast you've sat at my table and gorged at my feast and you're welcome you taught me some three months ago how you received travellers who can't reach barrow i've returned you the compliment old boy to-day for i've shown you how guests are received at the bay lest the lesson be lost on so churlish a lout take that sir and that and he kicked him bang out another a governor felt it his duty to go to arrange matters twixt one king john and his foe between whom had arisen bloodthirsty dissensions but towards this boor king he'd the kindest intentions john couldn't have treated him worse had he been the agent of moshish instead of the queen not a single gun popped off a sensation louder perhaps that's because he was hard up for powder but for all that was done by this potented bold sir philip too might have stopped out in the cold for the welcome john gave him a name comes in handy the spirit he showed to his guest was boor brandy three months had passed by and king john now at peace from work and for office obtained a release so primed well with blue blacks he thought he'd go down to spend them and his holidays there in cape town when the governor heard john was coming that way he said tis my turn at reception to play let those guns which since duke alfred came have been mute be charged to discharge him a royal salute Crips, lion king john like a real kingly brute and soldiers be sure you do the right thing let an orderly tent this disorderly king get rolls of tobacco his pipe well to cram and lay in a stock of cape smoke and sheet em and order some horse hides first hand from our knackers to make him a pair of right regal boor crackers he'll go to bed in them but that doesn't matter put him up in my bed twill his vanity flatter i can sleep on the sofa or hearthrug instead we must heap coals of fire on king johnny's head he has shown me how friends are received in the free state i'll show him how foes are received here by me moral twill be strange now if all this reception and rout should end in john's getting the dirty kick out h w bidwell altenhage twenty fourth of june eighteen sixty nine end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Welcome by H. W. Bidwell. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Welcome. Let gladness fill our British homes. All hearts rejoice. A victor comes. Not like the conquerors of yore, with laurels stained by human gore. Let earth a floral welcome yield. No devastation marks the field whereon his victory was gained. His triumphs peaceful and unstained let little children's voices rise for no discordant orphans cries shall mar their glee his deeds though great and pregnant with the will of fate are heralds of a happier day and pure and innocent as they let gentle ladies lend their cheers his conquests free from widow's tears let manly voices swell the strain his course is not over brothers slain no soldiers scarred and maimed proclaim a bloody source of all his fame his triumph is over ancient wrong over prejudices old and strong time honoured time dishonouring peace justice hope tis his to bring children of loyal men tis meet your cherub voices fresh and sweet should rise to heaven in welcome cheers for when in your maturer years the seed this his blessed work to sow shall spring up round you with you grow and cover like some sheltering tree your future happier destiny your voices then much deeper grown shall tell to children than your own how wodehouse and his noble dame midst shouts of infant welcome came how ranged like soldiers on the green you sang god save our gracious queen he comes like me to a bride and bold scorning the track traversed of old by orbs whose fastly waning light is sinking in the realms of night he seeks the cradle of the dawn where freedom's sun proclaims the morn this day will give to joy at least this day the light dawns in the east and soon beneath its genial ray north south east west shall feel this day h w bidwell grahamstown february first eighteen sixty four end of poem this recording is in the public domain precepts for young and old by h w bidwell read for librivox dot org by sonia precepts for young and old i'd like to speak a word to you my pretty careless child I'd learn that spell that daily lures you midst the blossoms wild. I join you and the butterflies with which you sport and play, as innocent, as beautiful, as fairy-like as they. I'd like to scan the purity that halos your fair brow, to fathom all the gentle thoughts that through your bosom flow. But oh, the wish is doubly vain, tis not for heart like mine to enter that pure heaven which forms the fairyland of thine i'd like to speak a word with you my timid blushing maid pausing at every step you take as if you were afraid as if by instinct you foresaw the weeds of woe and strife that grow up in the pathway of your unseen future life o oh, happy ten times happy were you could you shun the wild and rugged waste and turning back forever be a child you cannot then i'd say to you retain as best you may the pure and holy freshness of your childhood's cloudless day i'd like to speak a word with you my bold and wayward youth i'd counsel you to cherish in your heart the love of truth i'd caution you against wantonness and arrogance and pride and bid you fear your passions more than all the world beside i'd have you honour age whose precepts now you hear with scorn remember we were men my boy long long ere you were born have trodden long ago the path which you have yet to tread and now bequeath experience which may serve you when we are dead i'd like to speak a word with you brave sir in manhood's prime the world seems now your heritage and tis so for a time aspire for tis your birthright but remember while you mount you're but a steward and some day must yield up your account you're wealthy turn not from the poor 
they share your right to live or god would not have made them as you've received so give nor like the unjust creditor sees all men's laws allow you will need mercy at the last see that you meet it now i'd speak to you grey-headed man now tottering at death's door gazing on life's red page by sin and sorrow blotted o'er how wistfully your eye has passed you never may recall and wish since life must end like this you'd never lived at all o oh, look to him whom you despised while it was your lot to live remember mercy is his will his first wish to forgive haste for that dark door opens be saved while yet you may alas that it should close again and you should pass away h w bidwell grahamstown october first eighteen sixty three end of poem this recording is in the public domain be kind to one another read for librivox dot org by drew conway be kind to one another the alchemist's magic stone that turns to gold the dross of life is love and love alone how many who now fret and weep or minor griefs might smother if they would but this mandate keep be kind to one another be kind to one another sweet words and gentle looks set free the love streams of the soul as springs unlock the brooks but pride and coldness seal the hearts of good men from each other if thou wouldst learn men's nobler parts be kind to one another be kind to one another what thou a churlish elf thy neighbour seem must thou retort and be as bad thyself couldst thou the secret heart behold of any erring brother thou in the worst wouldst find some gold be kind to one another be kind to one another life is too short to waste in foolish enmity and strife time flies with ruthless haste soon death with an impartial hand will level foe and brother o oh, prize the hours thy must command be kind to one another h m bidwell end of poem this recording is in the public domain Paddy's Love Symptoms by H. W. Bidwell Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Paddy's Love Symptoms For Music Oh, what have you done with me, Daisy? You plump little rosy young witch! Sure, my head and my heart's so uneasy, I scarcely can tell which is which. Whenever I come in your sweet presence, It's telegraphed all over, I feel. If I touch you, Oh, murder, it kills me, just like an electrified eel. Your eyes are like flashings of lightning, glancing there, darting here, oh, so frisky. Your sweet breath, more intoxicating, by far than old Irish whiskey. Each eye, each limb, and each action, your garments too, every stitch, are all bent on Patrick's destruction, you plump little rosy young witch. I learned a long speech to say to you when I came to your house the other day, but I sat there as dumb as mackerel, and that's every word I could say. For my heart grew so awfully jealous to think that my tongue should address you that it jumped up and stuck in my throttle before I could gasp out, God bless you. I told the good father confessor my troubles, says he, but I'm sure you're bewitched by some wicked young fairy and i only know one means of cure but he says that same cure is quite easy he'll soon make all right if i bring to church one fine morn my sweet daisy and likewise a little gold ring end of poem this recording is in the public domain Proverbial Philosophy of Humbug 
by H. W. Bidwell, July 28, 1865. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Great is the power of humbug. Credulous, very, is Buncombe. By Buncombe that seeth things only as they are distorted by humbug. Humbug that useth poor Buncombe's vanity, whims, and caprices as medicines through which to show him the facts and the figures around him. Facts are reputed as stubborn, but not half so stubborn as asses. Asses who spurn out at facts and bray at the mention of figures. Figures that show that the West is the spot that aboundeth in asses. Great is the power of humbug. Credulous vary our asses. Hast thou not heard of a quadruped, of this same genus, Jerusalem, innocent slave of a needy but very ingenious carpenter? Carpenter who the green spectacles fixed on the nose of his neddy. Neddy who straightway ate shavings, thinking them first-rate green forage. That was the triumph of humbug over the weakness of Buncombe. Even thus Buncombe devoureth the rubbish presented by humbug. True that the similes wooden, true that the metaphor is donkeyfied. Asinine also, and wooden the subject it seeketh to illustrate. Solomon's fame for his wisdom, Multano's Solomon's prophet. Small is the prophet that Solomon's wisdom secureth his minions. He putteth green spectacles fast on the nose of poor western netties. The poor mokes believe his chaff grass, and devoured all with much gusto. Figures are all topsy turvable, may be read backwards or forwards. Sixes inverted are nines, and nines with their tails off are ciphers. All western donkeys are curtailed, thus there is no end of asses. Dobson went forth from the east with his cranium crammed full of figures, figures which made the inflated westerns to let off their gas and collapse like mere bubbles of error when pierced by the arrows of truth. Dobson retired from the conquest to rest neath the shade of his laurels. Molteno purloined his figures and curtailed his nines and his sixes. And all this to show that the rotten old shank bone abounded in maggots. Dobson returned, unsuspecting, to visit the scene of past glory. Oh, how the poor Nettie's brayed when they fancied the trick had succeeded! Oh, what an asinine course greeted the heroes returning! What wonder that Dobson retreated, disgusted, nauseated, and bilious. The stomach, accustomed to good Christian beef and orthodox cabbage, will turn against infidel snork and rice in its abomination. Disgust they mistook for defeat. Contempt they imagined was chagrin. What bad living did for our hero, they fancied their wit had accomplished. Contempt and disgust are two dignified weapons for poor abject Buncombe. Still they bray o'er their own self-deception, while Dobson sits calm in his garden smoking his dadeen, the calumet of a sound head and clear conscience. He knows, though his figures were stolen and mischievously mutilated like the sheep of Bo Peep, they'll come home and bring all their pendants behind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Platyclip Cascade by B. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Platyclip Cascade. Where the Olympian cloth is spread, there thou art cradled, nursed, and bred, bursting into life anew, thirsting for celestial dew, drinking from the ambrosial fountain sinking through the veined mountain moving roving gravitating sliding gliding percolating coursing on through channels hidden forcing passages unbidden winding into cave and cell finding out where naiads dwell spurting out through crack and chink flirting on each flower-clad brink creeping over banks and mosses weeping with the moist-eyed mosses straying on midst foliage fair playing with sweet maidenhair rippling through enchanted grots tippling with forget-me-nots swelling into pools translucent welling over wild recusant 
dashing, flushing, splashing, gushing, whirling, eddying, swirling, rushing, spreading out upon the plain, threading on thy course again, flowing brook-like through the wood, growing to a larger flood, fertilizing, fructifying, man's and nature's needs supplying, gliding down time's silent river to the ocean of forever. B. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Port Elizabeth Pyramid by William Selvin. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Port Elizabeth Pyramid. The pyramid which forms the subject of the following lines is the most prominent historical monument of Port Elizabeth. It stands on the brow of the hill overlooking Algoa Bay in an open space known as the Donkin Reserve. It is built of rough stone and is about 35 feet in height, each side of the base being about 25 feet. On its western side, a slate tablet is inserted exhibiting the following inscription. Elizabeth Francis, Lady Donkin, eldest daughter of Dr. George Markham, Dean of York, died at Merat, in Upper Hindustan, of a fever after seven days' illness, on the 21st of August, 1818, aged not quite twenty-eight years. She left an infant in his seventh month, too young to know the unequalled loss he had sustained, and a husband whose heart is still wrung by undiminished grief. He erected this pyramid, August, 1820. On its eastern side, a similar tablet appears exhibiting the following. To the memory of one of the most perfect of human beings, who has given her name to the town below. Sermons in stones, and good in everything. Shakespeare I seek not with a weak and untuned lyre To sound the praise of Cheops' mighty pile, Where toiling myriads, higher and still higher, In the dim past, beside the swirling Nile, Heaped up those giant masses to the sky, Upon whose hoary sides old time's grim teeth Have spent their force in vain. From task so high my muse with trembling shrinks. If ever a wreath should decorate her brow, Twill twine among themes of lowly sort. Be hers the touch that thrills heart's deepest chords. Be hers the light that beams from nature's restful face. The love that fills the home with flowers of Eden's chastened bloom. And surely this love-reared memorial pile, To sacred dust enshrined in Indian tomb, A theme congenial yields. The worldling smile, incredulous, Mayhap reveals the thought, That from rough stone no poet flowers can rise In gladdening bloom, no wisdom's lore be taught. Erected here perchance to tranquilize That undiminished grief, whose darksome tide For too long years had whelmed Sir Rufain's heart, this pyramid on Donkin's hill beside the towering lighthouse stands, and with rude art its sculptured tablets tell that she whose loss the stricken husband mourned a babe had left, too young to feel the orphan's bitter cross, and earth in her recall had been bereft of one pure gem whose ray reflected heaven. In touching tones the simple record speaks the fondness of a heart by anguish riven. Methinks hot tears bestream his haggard cheeks, as memory mirrors her loved form to view, and all her tender ministrations pour in recollections soft as evening dew. The well-known voice, now hushed for evermore, has left its echoes sighing through his heart, and as her faith and tranquil virtues rose to vision clear, he sought but to impart a brief epitome that should disclose all that she was to him, when on her scroll this record he inscribed, that all might know that she was one most perfect human soul, whose name in fragrance marks the town below. When gloomy night her sable mantle spreads, and storm winds fill the seaman's heart with fear, the lighthouse pours its placid ray and sheds a soft effulgence on this tribute dear. The keeper's cottage, nestling low between the lighthouse and the sombre monument, shares the mild radiance that overspreads the scene whose light appears with mystic shadows blend. What sober thought may faith's clear eye perceive, with fancy's pictures fair to interweave? Light from above reveals the rocks and shoals, whose earth-born flashes shipwreck storm-tossed souls. 
light from above illumes the smiling home light from above irradiates the tomb light from above with sympathetic glow overgilds the memories of our deepest woe william selvin port elizabeth thirteenth of november eighteen eighty five end of poem this recording is in the public domain in memoriam by william selvin read for librivox dot org by sonia in memoriam the reverend r templeton who died in the zurberg forest january eighteen eighty six by winding paths amid the tangled woods that skirt the silent deep kloofed zurberg hill a lately wedded pair meandering fill their cup of tender joy the peace that broods over nature's tranquil face reflected shines from loving eyes as they in converse sweet plot out a rose-fringed path with prudence meet and mark with glowing hearts its pleasant lines mysterious are thy ways great king of saints in sudden fear they vainly strive to thread their homeward track when lo the husband faints deaf to her voice with agonizing dread she dares the maze in search of human aid in vain the teacher sleepeth in the shade william selvin port elizabeth twenty fifth of january eighteen eighty six end of poem this recording is in the public domain lord what is man that thou art mindful of him by william selvin read for librivox dot org by sonia lord what is man that thou art mindful of him panting climbers to some barren height eager chasers of some phantom light emmets piling wayside domes of clay that crush to dust the whirlwind sweeps away toilers vain o lord are we fluttering nightbirds dazzled by the day wayworn travellers who have lost their way miners groping slowly in the gloom children sobbing round a mother's tomb blind and helpless lord are we flowerets drooping in the noontide sun autumn leaves descending one by one bubbles dancing on life's foaming wave shadowy spirits hurrying to the grave frail and fleeting lord are we trembling sparklets of immortal fire infant songsters mid an angel choir tiny parts of one complex machine guided by an architect unseen none unnoticed lord by thee dewdrops glistening in a radiant love diamond sand grains registered above separate nurslings of a father's care that gently numbers every silken hair weak and faithless though we be william selvin january eighteen eighty six end of poem this recording is in the public domain the rhyme of the ox wagon by william selvin read for librivox dot org by sonia the rhyme of the ox wagon a modest pendant to pringles afar in the desert away with the cynic who ceaselessly sighs for some new-fangled bauble some novel surprise give me the heart that with generous glow lights up the friendships of long long ago green be the memories of pleasure gone by when youth filled the cup and no care breathed a sigh fain would i weave into light tripping rhyme the frolicsome joys of the good olden time ere our evergreen forests and still wilds were scared by the ear-piercing screech of the railway dragon and a thousand long miles were triumphantly dared neath the cosy white tent of a good ox wagon how jocund the shout of the old driver jan with his grimy felt hat and his jacket of tan the crack of his whip waking echoes around while the startled bushbuck clears the path with a bound as the tall forest trees bent their heads neath the breeze so our team breasts the steep with a labouring wheeze then down the long slope in a sinuous race they scamper along at a bullock's best pace 
Woo ha! shouts the driver, woo ha! for the sake of the small totty leader with scarcely a rag on, who capers and hoots, gamely striving to break the headlong descent of the good ox wagon. How grateful the halt near the bush margin stream, where outspent our hungry and sweltering team, lave their hot dusty hoofs, and with heads bending low, drink the nectar that Adam imbibed long ago. Old Jan and the Tot gather sticks for a fire to prepare the hot coffee, what liquor ranks higher, and the lush carbonatje, whose tender delight to the palate still clings, though you've dainties inside. With biscuits and biltong we finish our feast. Perhaps we may take a small sip from the flagon, then join in the chase of a runaway beast who freedom prefers to the good ox wagon. The inspanning finished, Jack shoulders his rifle. His longing for venison all gentle thoughts stifle. Peeping Bob is intent upon catching things horrid, while Bill, who confesses to sympathies florid, gathers trophies galore of old Cape's blossomed splendor, while a grateful thought leaps to the bountiful sender. Such our innocent joys, while our caravan rumbles at three miles an hour to the trysting at Bumbles. Fain would I tell of our jollity there, but time gently warns me to tackle the dragon. So I leave you to picture our sumptuous fare while we drank happy days with the good ox wagon. Well, what have we gained by our steaming hot hurry but timetables, tariffs, debts, drivings and worry? We've dropped half an hour by a trick that looks sturdy. Old five o'clock reads as the modern four-thirty. On a sliding scale lately we've slid fast enough, though the ways of that slide have been terribly rough. Dame Fortune has stripped many a home of its charms, devoured our profits and mortgaged our farms. Our wool, wine and wisdom are not in high feather, but up with the whipstick, bent hope's sunny flag on. Give a long pull, a strong pull, a pull all together, and cheers shall yet ring from the old Cape Wagon. William Selvin, Port Elizabeth, 20th of March, 1886. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cape of Good Hope by William Selvin. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Cape of Good Hope, a patriotic song. Land of serene and sunny skies, land of the lion and fleet gazelle, land where the summer never dies, Cape of Good Hope, we love thee well. Land where the birds in gorgeous plume flit through the bush or their love song tell, land where the flowers show Eden's bloom, Cape of Good Hope, we love thee well. Land where the hunter scours the plain, free as a bird over the ocean swell, land of kind nature's soothing strains, Cape of Good Hope, we love thee well. Land where the grape and the orange grow, deep in yon cool sequestered dell, land of the melon's luscious flow, Cape of Good Hope, we love thee well. Land where the fields of golden grain, rich in their bounteous fruitage, swell, Land of sleek herds in lengthened train, Cape of Good Hope, we love thee well. Land of a stalwart yeoman race, Stern, but with hearts as true as a bell, Homely, but full of a kindly grace, Cape of Good Hope, we love thee well. Land of the dark Amakosa tall, Seeking release from the savage spell, Land where there's room and to spare for all, Cape of Good Hope, we love thee well. Land of good hope, our prayer we raise. May peace and plenty with thee dwell, filling our hearts with grateful praise for this bright land we love so well. W. Selvin. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Erethina Tree by M. E. Barber, Grimstown, March 9, 1884. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. A Carol of the Woods Bright, glorious Erythrina tree, Queen of the forests near the sea, Herald of springtide, wild and free, 
thy scarlet blossoms reared on high above the woods in beauty lie tinted in russet purple dye while morning beams and laughing glances are quivering amongst thy branches and glowing flowers as day advances bright and glorious erythrina tree queen of the woods beside the sea haunt of the sunbird and the bee neath sunny skies they feast for hours quaffing sweet nectar from thy flowers whose scarlet petals fall in showers on dark and amethystine wing flitting from flower to flower they sing their joyous songs to thee in spring a shower of ringing notes on high apparently from out the sky descend to earth all merrily while the cicada's ceaseless strain from day to day again again is heard through the forest dell and lane thrilling the woods a wild refrain bright glorious erythrina how thy scarlet blossoms clothe each bough the red man of the woods art thou with thy broad banner floating free proclaiming seed time silently to each dark aborigine no written calendars have they thy early flowers brook no delay the season do for toil all day when kafir maids with hoe in hand off to the fields a cheerful band they go to plant umbua land singing a wild wild roundelay while o'er each pick and the sunbeams play working in time the livelong day bright glorious erythrina tree as time flies imperceptibly the spring's precursor thou shalt be high o'er the forest dark and green thy crown of beauty will be seen while sweeping seasons intervene and many a field of golden corn spread over sloping hill and lawn shall ripen on each jocund morn and many a brilliant sunbird's songs shall echo the lone woods among while red-winged lorries pass along and from the shadowy depths below their deep-toned notes in cadence flow as sounding through the woods they go far from the busy world away where singing toils the bee all day mid the deep woods where sunbeams play bright glorious erythrina tree remote from cities near the sea my winged thoughts have flown to thee queen of the woods i love thee well o oh, for a home with thee to dwell for ever in the forest dell from life's stern battle would i hide by some bright sparkling fountain's side regardless of all time or tide forgotten be the world's wild roar the turmoils of her careworn shore oblivion she'll be evermore my canopy the sheltering trees my dream the song of birds and bees good-bye to all things saving these end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of the poetry of south africa by alexander wilmot